Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Hey, glad to have you with us again on another edition of A Reason for Hope. Scott Richards here with Sean Richards, ready to take your questions on the Bible. That's what we do each and every day at this time. Uh, Your questions about uh, maybe a passage in the Bible you'd like to explore. Maybe you'd like to find out how to more effectively apply the principles, the precepts. Uh, Maybe even learn from the practical examples uh, we find in Scripture and be smack dab in the middle of God's good, acceptable, and perfect will for your life. That's what we're here to do, but we can't do it uh, without you. So we'd encourage you to be a vital part of our broadcast uh, by joining us on our live Facebook feed at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. You can go on there and uh, then uh, log on in to our comment corner. On the comment corner, you can let us, uh, first of all, know that you're watching. Always uh, interesting to find out where people are watching the broadcast and as well get your questions to us we can answer those questions for you in real time maybe you're wondering about the events of the day even the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy we are all over that as well wherever we go uh, we want to go where you would like to go in the word of god Uh, just so wonderful to have this uh, listener and viewer driven broadcast each and every day so uh, jump on in with those questions our lines are available for you right now if you're joining us uh, on uh, Facebook, that's uh, where you can go, our comment corner. If you are listening to us on one of our radio affiliates like uh, Reach Radio here in Tucson, KNKT in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or Life FM in Miami, Florida, you can also uh, take advantage of uh, getting us a question by uh, sending us an email at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Questions for hope at gmail.com is our email address. You can also uh, use our toll-free number, 1-877-556-1212, 1-877-556-1212, and uh, we'll pick up all the charges for the call. That will, of course, get you to our Google Mail uh, app, and uh, they will ask you who you want to leave the message for. Just say a reason for hope, and then after the beep, uh, let, it, your, let us have your question. It'll give us uh, a uh, written uh, breakdown of your question from text to speech and uh, what a wonderful thing it is that we can even uh, answer your questions in real time as they come on in. one 556 1212. Uh, joined here again, as I mentioned, by my right hand man, protege, all around good guy, Sean Richards. Uh, Sean, how about if we uh, kick off the broadcast in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Father, thank you so much that you love us, and thank you so much that you're here with us. And thank you, Lord, for the awesome promise of your spirit uh, guiding and leading us into all truth. That's what we pray would happen here today. Lord, we pray that you would give us an openness of heart, uh, perhaps to see uh, new and uh, wonderful things uh, which we know not, as your scripture says you will uh, lead us to. Uh, Maybe even uh, shore up and solidify our foundation so we can share more confidently in this world, so in desperate need of your love and your touch. But however uh, you want to uh, lead us, Lord, we give the broadcast to you, and we pray that not by might or by power, but by your spirit, hearts and lives will be touched and uh, touched forever. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, for those of you who are joining us on our live feed, you may have noticed that uh, about a minute ago, I adopted a very immature grin. And that's because our first question here is from S.A., who wants to know, is the Song of Solomon full of induendo, or am I reading into it? Now, I can get in so much trouble for answering this question, so why don't I default to you being the more mature of us? (laughs) Well, I I don't know about mature at least I'm older uh, there's no there's no fool like an old fool I guess mm. yeah you know essay you've got a uh, you've got a great question there because uh, there is no doubt about the fact that the song of Solomon also called the song of songs that we find uh, immediately after uh, the uh, the book of Ecclesiastes uh, in uh, the section of wisdom in our Bibles. I think it's uh, nice that it does show up uh, after Ecclesiastes because Ecclesiastes, uh, boy, if you're feeling like you're too peppy or too excited or feeling too positive about life, that'll be one that can bring you down a little bit. But Song of Solomon is a, uh, a celebration 
of a relationship between uh, King Solomon and a uh, woman who's unnamed, aside from being called the uh, Shulamite. And uh, the we really don't know too much about her, uh, where she is from. We do know that uh, she was part of an agrarian family and uh, was oftentimes uh, given a hard time by her older sisters and and so forth. But uh, the Song of Solomon is exactly that. I, I guess as far as a song is concerned, we would probably understand it uh, in our day and age almost like an opera because it has a number of different movements. Uh, it tells a story of uh, the courtship and uh, marriage uh, of Solomon and uh, this Shulamite woman. Now, uh, the controversy about uh, this, uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, piece of literature is this. Uh, it doesn't pull any punches about the level of passion that is described between Sh uh, Solomon and the Shulamite as their relationship unfolds. In fact, some of the uh, material that we see in it is uh, quite uh, well poetic and uh, we might even say explicit as far as their enjoyment of uh, married love. Now, the, the controversy uh, about this uh, particular uh, 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 opera, if you will, uh, this song that we find here, is that uh, there? it's always been a kind of a puzzling thing as to why it's included in the canon of Scripture. Uh, you know, it's really very horizontally uh, uh, oriented as far as uh, relationships in the here and now. And, and because of that, uh, Jewish scholars uh, from around the time of Christ uh, said, well, this can't just be talking about a love affair between Solomon and uh, this woman. Uh, it's got to be an allegory. And so Solomon, they would say, rep would represent God, and uh, the woman would represent Israel, and it would be God's love for Israel. Riffing off of that, uh, you know, where there were many uh, scholars, especially in the early church, who would say that this was a picture of Jesus and uh, his bride, the bride of Christ. And I certainly think there are some principles and overtones to all of that. But when we approach a, a, a piece of scripture, we have to always defer back, I think, to one compass heading, one GPS heading that will keep us out of a peck of trouble. Uh, when the natural sense makes sense, seek no other sense, lest you believe in nonsense. Yeah, we often say that here on the, on the broadcast. And, and I don't think it's nonsensical to say there's illusions and, uh, and uh, symbols of the great love that God has for us here. But on the ground, uh, what the, the Song of Solomon is really all about uh, is that God is the one who designed marriage. And within marriage, God designed the physical aspect of marriage, that is the sexual relationship within marriage, to be something to be celebrated uh, and uh, seen as a true gift of God. Now, the reason I think we have this cautionary tale uh, in the Bible about uh, the uh, exalted place of the sexual relationship and intimacy within marriage is that down through time, it seems like there's this default position that uh, God is this... Uh, uh, very uh, aloof and distant, cold guy on a throne with a long white beard and a sneer on his face, a long bony finger looking for somebody who's going to have fun, and by golly, he's going to put an end to that. Uh, you know, if uh, anything, I think, uh, can put the lie to that, uh, it's the fact that God is the one who designed sex, and he designed it for two reasons. Number one, he designed it for procreation. There's no doubt about that. But uh, God could have uh, designed procreation to work in a way that uh, we could have uh, promulgated the species by, uh, say, uh, putting a Q-tip in our ear or something like that. Uh, God could have done it in a number of different ways, but God designed uh, sex not just for promoting the species, but also uh, for pleasure and for a bonding that would take place, that one flesh relationship that God designed us to enjoy within uh, the the uh, the context of marriage, you know, it's really interesting uh, the uh, exuberant ex uh, expression of passion uh, we find within this book is also balanced out uh, by an exhortation to uh, for this couple to remain pure until the appropriate time of this celebration. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter two. 
And uh, verse uh, 6 says, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. This is one of those, you know, very uh, uh, intimate uh, pictures of what's going on. But then this next line, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. You know, in other words, there is this boundary here. There is a time and a place for this celebration of this kind of love. And in uh, the the uh, the context of how God has designed marriage, that is in the one man, one woman committed together for life relationship that we call marriage. Uh, we take the sexual relationship outside of the one man, one woman committed together for life relationship we call marriage and inevitably damage takes place because our sexuality is a very powerful but very fragile part of who we are. I mean, uh, the idea of uh, just allowing someone else to be able to see you in a way that nobody else ever gets a chance to see you, uh, being that vulnerable with somebody else. Obviously, if someone takes that and just uses that for their pleasure, and then when the thrill is gone, as B.B. King once sang, uh, tosses you aside for somebody else, well, then the real intimacy that God designed the uh, relationship to lead to is uh, completely wiped out. Uh, you know, the, the idea that we should have marriage as a place where that kind of trust uh, begins to thrive and to grow is a beautiful picture. And it's also, you know, as far as the spiritual implications go, you know, we could go into a number of the different uh, passages that we find in the Song of Solomon uh, and, uh, you know, how it, they, they are fairly uh, explicit, fairly graphic, and so on. But the, uh, the overriding principle behind all of this and why as well we find it within our Bibles is because God designed the marriage relationship, including the sexual relationship, to point us to a greater relationship. And that is the relationship that, that Christ has uh, with his church. Uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter uh, 5, uh, there's a, a fascinating statement that the Apostle Paul makes regarding the nature of, uh, of marriage and why God has designed marriage to function in the way that it is. Uh, quoting the book of Genesis in verse 31, we say, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, what we experience in the best of our relationships on the horizontal is designed to show us that there is a greater relationship yet ahead, uh, a greater relationship uh, where we're going to experience the purity of love and a satisfaction and an intimacy in our relationship with God that uh, the marriage relationship here can only hint at. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I think we have books like Song of Solomon in the Bible. Anything you'd add to that, Sean? You don't want to know, but <laughs> as far as what's appropriate for all audiences, I think the best thing to note about Song of Solomon is that it was put in Scripture for the same reason anything else was put in Scripture. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon were all held to the standard of a prophet of God, which Solomon claimed to be, not just by association to David, but by the testing of the words that he put forward. And uh, as far as the very interesting nature of Song of Solomon, which was alluded to by Paul in the book of Ephesians as a picture of Jesus' relationship with the church, we need to also understand there is a literal event being recapped for us here. And while these events definitely use certain symbols and uh, descriptors that may or may not register in our day and age, uh, one that I uh, probably think would do you the most good to not misread, uh, lest insinuations run awry. Uh, in Song of Solomon chapter 8 and verse 1, the Shunammite says, oh, that you were like... Uh, Oh, that you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I could find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. That is a cultural reference to the fact that uh, PDA was very frowned upon in Israel. If she was her brother, or rather if uh, he was her brother, then she could kiss him in public and not have to worry about that being uncomfortable. But if, on the other hand, it was her husband, that was considered improper. So note that she doesn't have some sort of 
interest in family relations and wants that to spice up the love life. I've seen people try and put this forward. Also note that uh, some of the illustrations she goes, and I won't read them here unless you want me to, just ask. <laughs> but the emphasis is, of course, on the nature of these parts of, uh, of both of their anatomies. Uh, your uh, arms are like uh, towers of Lebanon. It's referring to something strong and great. But when it ultimately comes down to any reference of God in the book, we don't have a direct citation. Uh, there's two books of the Bible by the way, where God isn't directly named, but we see his involvement within it. Song of Solomon and Esther, believe it or not. Right. Now, Song of Solomon, uh, the ones who argue where God spoke is in chapter 6 and verse... Oh no, uh, I skipped ahead here. Uh, this was on their wedding night. This was, oh, in chapter 5 and verse 1, where uh, an individual, we aren't sure who, says during their wedding night, their honeymoon, Eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Now, there is debate on whether that's God speaking and observing and approving of the marriage act. That's certainly consistent with the Bible as a whole. But, uh, yeah, if you are noticing some double meaning to some of these passages, understand there is no double meaning. They meant it, and it is supposed to make your body temperature rise a little bit. That was the point. But note that this is in our Bibles for a reason, and there is a case to be made, uh, multiple cases, in fact, that God isn't ashamed of or embarrassed by the concept of sex. The only reason why it should be handled with care is the same reason as a chainsaw. It can do a lot of good, but in the wrong hands or wrong direction or with improper handling, it can also do a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, one of the great analogies I've heard is that uh, our uh, sexual relation is like a, uh, a fire in a fireplace. Uh, on a cold night, if you have three uh, logs that are burning together in the fireplace, it's a great thing. It brings a lot of comfort. Uh, but if you take one of those logs and put it on the sofa, you've got a problem. So uh, definitely a, a time and a place for that. And that's what the Song of Solomon celebrates. All right. Uh, and any more questions are welcome. So, well, yeah, you, you are correct, uh, S.A. There is some uh, strong innuendo in the book. Oh, yeah. Uh, one specifics, let us know. We'll have a good laugh about it. Uh, question from Sean, different Sean. Uh, in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 20, it says the Lord sent the hornet, and he couldn't find the translation for what that is. Could you possibly provide an answer? Thanks. Uh, I sent you a link to Bible Hub, which includes the uh, Hebrew concordance. The term is hasira, and that's just referring to a common hornet, the yellow jackets or uh, yellow bands, the uh, killer uh, bees, but that they aren't your friend. The blight on nature, you can call them what you will, but it's referring to Murder those, hornets. Yeah, those uh, aggressive <laughs> uh, insects that basically serve no purpose other than to keep the other insects' populations under control and are their territory safe. Um, as far as the supernatural nature, obviously you can't train hornets. I'd be very concerned about the person who would consider that a hobby, but the emphasis in these passages was that in Deuteronomy as well as in Exodus God promised that he would use the forces of nature to assist Israel in their battles even though they had no grade A weapons I guess for their time or organized military structure God would be the one fighting with them and they would see that demonstrated in nature. Yeah uh, it's interesting uh, commentators will point out that uh, one of the symbols of Pharaoh's power uh, was the hornet and uh, if you've ever come across a hornet's nest and have seen these things get uh, stirred up, you know that they are nobody to trifle with. Around here, we often run into wasps. And uh, I have, uh, in my book, Reasonable Doubts, a, uh, an analogy about uh, my fledgling uh, attempt to be a, a do-it-yourself exterminator with a nasty wasp's nest uh, that uh, got going in our house. But there's an interesting scripture uh, where this uh, analogy uh, of a hornet is, uh, is brought up again. It's found in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 12. Uh, there uh, God said, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, also two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build. And you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you didn't plant. Well, this analogy of, uh, of a hornet, uh, some scholars believe that because a hornet was associated as a symbol of Pharaoh's military power bringing confusion to his enemies, uh, that uh, it was a picture of the fact that uh, Egypt living next to Canaan had sort of softened the Canaanites up, if you will, uh, for the conquest that Israel was going to go on. I think that's fairly weak uh, because it was definitely a supernatural thing that allowed uh, the people of Israel to be able to conquer the land. Uh, the, the best analogy, I think, 
uh, you know, you can take your pick. Number one would be that God supernaturally used these beasties uh, to uh, go before them and soften up the troops. And I'll tell you what, if you suddenly saw a huge swarm of hornets coming your way, you would uh, probably uh, forget all your well-worked plans. It reminds me of a classic line from the boxer Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the face. Uh, I think everybody would have a plan until a huge plague of hornets descended. I don't know if you've ever come uh, close to a swarm of, uh, say, insects that uh, kind of have a stinger of the business end. I remember running in Catalina State Park uh, one day, and I was running along, and suddenly it was like the ground in front of me just looked like it was shimmering. It was this weird, odd shadow, and then I heard this sound that sounded like a 747 jet uh, warming up its engines, and I looked behind me, and this huge black cloud of bees was just coming up behind me and I just went flat on the ground and let them go straight over me and and I mean it just it was like one of the most intimidating things I go you guys go man I'm just I'm I'm getting out of your way I've outsized you but you've outnumbered me yeah, I respect this exactly and and uh, you know and so you know bees can make an awful lot of noise in a swarm like that when they're following the queen to their their new uh, habitation but uh, hornets are a lot bigger than bees. And so I think it's a picture of the fact that uh, when God went before the people of Israel into the promised land, we see, for instance, in the situation re revolving around the Battle of Jericho, when the spies came in and spoke to Rahab, the people inside the walls were already terrified of the prospect of the Israelites coming their way because they had heard what happened even 40 years before about what had, uh, how God had uh, defeated uh, the mightiest army on earth and had humiliated Pharaoh, and now these people uh, were, were there. The, the people were absolutely terrified of this sort of thing. And yeah, so, Sihon and Og as well. They were the big boys in the Canaanite block, and they're like, man, if Texas fell, then what good is Oklahoma going to do? Exactly. So, you know, I think uh, what we see there is a picture of uh, God, uh, in a sense, using insects as a form of psychological warfare. It's an image of that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that, uh, you know, if uh, these beasties came in and ruined your picnic, you'd just be, you know, beating feet and trying to get out of harm's way. You wouldn't be thinking anymore about any kind of plans or arrangements you have here. Uh, there are some who will say that uh, this is a picture of just the supernatural nature of the conquest of Canaan, that it wouldn't happen by the arm or the strategy of the Israelites. And as we found out, uh, the defeat of Jericho without firing a shot, in a sense, the walls coming down so that God would be glorified. The subsequent defeat at Ai, uh, which was uh, so small, they just said, ah, oh, we're not even going to send the whole army. We'll just send an expeditionary force and wipe these uh, little juniors out there. Nothing compared to Jericho, but because there was sin in the camp, uh, the people of Israel were unable to even take Ai, which is a great reminder of the fact that any victory they had came from the mighty hand of God. So, you know, I think, I think there's uh, a, a good... Uh, element of that uh, being implied there as far as the hornet is uh, concerned. And if you've ever been around a uh, hornet's nest, I mean, we even use that as an analogy, you've stirred up a hornet's nest of controversy, that would be the loudest, most panic-inducing, uh, most fear-engendering uh, thing you could find. I think that's the, the image that we're dealing with there. So let us know if that helps you out. Now, here's an interesting one. This is uh, from Calvary Chapel of the Air, sent along to us by John. Thank you for sending that to us. Uh, who wants to know, what is the difference between loving one another and hating one another, but in the name of love, doing hateful things, but saying I'm doing it in love. How do you discern the difference between love and deed and indeed being loving? Wow. Uh, you know, so if I'm understanding the question here, people who justify abusive behavior, but say I was doing it out of love. This hurts me more than it hurts you kind of a thing? No, or? I think people looking for excuses. Okay. Well, uh, meaning I meant well, uh, when I told you that you're uh, a worthless individual and you'll never amount to anything, you know, is that uh, what we're talking about here? You know, the, the fact of the matter is someone can say uh, that uh, they love somebody, uh, but uh, if the deeds don't match the declaration, uh, they're just 
kidding themselves. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, we're, we're told, for instance, in uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Uh, you know, uh, uh, John goes on in uh, 1 John chapter 4 and uh, verse 20, it says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Uh, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have for him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. You know, John, I would tie that into the injunction that we find in Colossians, that we are to allow our, our speech to be grace seasoned with salt, that we might have the right, right answer for each person. And that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, situations that come up where a word of correction and rebuke is necessary, but uh, the the uh, word of correction and rebuke uh, has to be used like a surgeon's scalpel, not like a chainsaw. And uh, when people uh, do that sort of thing and uh, you know just vent or you know have their own wrong motivations for blasting someone, uh, but then uh, want to fall back and say, well, you know, I I, I did it in love. Well, you know, let's put it to the test. First Corinthians chapter four, or chapter thirteen, beginning at verse four, says, "Love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely." So, if what someone calls their act of love is, bottom line, just an expression of rudeness, I would question whether God is behind it. I would tend to think that that's just using the God talk to cover up the, what amounts to a manifestation of the flesh, and that's not something you got to receive. Yeah, and if you want more information, John, you can forward this along to the person who asked it. Uh, there was an interesting book C.S. Lewis wrote called The Four Loves, and we actually have an audio recording of his voice talking through those lectures as a combination of some of his radio transmissions. Now, what was important to note about The Four Loves, he goes into the four Greek terms for love, agape, eros, storge, and phileo. And in the uh, final three, agape obviously is God's love, and the only flaw in it is that only God can do it. It's not in our nature. We need to adopt God's nature if we're capable of it. That's its only weakness. He goes into some very interesting analyses and comparisons with a, with a phileo, storge, and eros. Uh, eros obviously is easy to abuse because eros in that it's the ex, uh, uh, physical form of love, an attraction to something. It is very easy to abuse because it can become the primary motivator for a relationship and then likewise a motivator for other relationships to the same degree. It's very indecisive about its focus. It needs a combination of others in order for it to be genuine. Uh, aga or, uh, let's see, Eros, uh, phileo, is a form of respectful love, uh, the ability to show affection towards somebody. He mentions that this can be used to manipulate people. I'll do this nice thing for you, but I'm keeping notes. And then the final one, uh, storge, this admiration or respect for someone, he actually uses as something that can be abused within a family. He gave the illustration of a mother who uh, washes the dishes and cleans the clothes and uh, prepares all these meals and goes goes so far as to say the kids would wish that she didn't, but she's always making sure that she can use these demonstrations as, and this is the real clincher, a reason to, and a way to remind herself that she is truly a loving person. Even if her actions are, and this is uh, tying into phileo as well, uh, this almost abrasive attempt to demonstrate kindness and charity towards someone, it ends up being unloving because it's ultimately driven by a self-affirming sense or insecurity of the relationship. So when people demonstrate tough love, this can be another way of justifying that. I want to be rude, but I also want to make sure that it isn't harming these relationships. I want to express my emotions but without the consequence. So if you're talking to an individual that's say perhaps getting the terms confused, I'd not only point them to this book but to the individual who sent the question, if you're on the receiving end, reading that book might give you the chance to understand where that person is coming from and be able to effectively communicate, hey, I don't see this as loving. 
and this is the real issue at hand here. I don't care what your motives are, this is how I'm taking it. And then you can get down to the real heart of the matter. You referenced 1 John chapter 2. I'd recommend going to the next chapter where uh, John also observed in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18. He said, Little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, that we assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence towards God. Now, people can fool themselves into thinking, hey, God's on my side in this because I meant it out of love. Well, there's uh, the promise that I'll ne never leave you or forsake you. That can be a blessing or a curse based on a guilty conscience. And sometimes people may seem like they are fully convinced in their own mind that they are doing this out of love, but God's not mocked. And the more that they are given room to be convicted about that, the better off, A, they're going to be and the recipients of the manipulation. If that was the heart of the question, John, then I hope that helps you out. Yeah, and, and, it's, yeah. and, and you know, once again, uh, we really need to have discernment because it can work both ways. Sometimes people that don't want any kind of correction within their life and they're going down the wrong path are going to say, well, it's very unloving for you to say to me that, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't be cohabitating with my girlfriend, right? now no it's not unloving it's saying you know the bridge is out this isn't the way god intends for your relationship to progress god can't bless your relationship if you're not doing things according to his word so i think uh, the the giver and the receiver in a situation where you know rebuke is uh, is uh you know the the order of the day have to be very very careful you know it reminds me of what galatians chapter 6 says brethren if any man is overtaken any trespass you are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourselves lest you also be tempted bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ you know in other words if i'm going to get in the business of straightening someone out and correcting them it's not so that i can show i'm right and you're wrong it's not that, uh, you know, I can get into a place where you've irritated me and stirred me up and so I'm going to vent emotionally. It, it means that I have to care about that person that I'm correcting. And if that care isn't there, you know, it can it really end up uh, being kind of a, a gnarly thing. You know, one situation where I was... Uh, personally corrected. I was asked to speak at a retreat. Uh, the section of scripture that uh, we were going through was the Sermon on the Mount. And I was given the section in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that dealt with uh, not making oaths, but letting your yes be yes and let your no be no. And, you know, I explained how the uh, Pharisees at that time had so taken something that originally was good but had overlaid it with so much tradition, it just made it of no effect. You know, in other words, they said you could swear, uh, you couldn't swear by the temple, but that, that wasn't binding, but if you swore by the gold of the temple, then that was binding, and it's just this spiritual nitpicking that was going on. You know, and I said, you know, lest we, you know, get down on the Pharisees, we do the same thing. You know, we tend to out-Bible the Bible and add to our traditions and so on. And I said, you know, take uh, the kind of music that you hear in church. You know, take organ music, for instance. Uh, you know, I've, on good authority, the organ wasn't around when Jesus was around, but to go to church, you would think that it was, and ha-ha, and everybody kind of laughed and, and all of this, and... And uh, I said, you know, me personally, I don't own any organ albums, you know, not really a fan, but hey, you know, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that we associate with church. And I moved on. Well, afterwards, there were some people waiting to talk and, you know, and pray and so forth. And this one woman kind of waited to the end. And uh, she began to share with me about how her mom uh, and her grandmother were both missionaries and, and how God had used them in such powerful ways. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. And then she said, uh, and they both play the organ every Sunday of their lives. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. And I said, well, actually, you know, my grandmother was an organist in the Episcopal Church. So I get it. And he said, you discredited their ministry and you put them down. And, and now nobody's going to like organ music because you said, you know, what you said. I'm, I was thinking, man, I don't think I have that much power. But, you know, the conversation wasn't getting anywhere good. So I, I fell back on the... Uh, let's try to find middle ground here, something we can agree upon. And, and, I, and I said, well, you know, I can see that, I you know, we have a couple different 
points of view uh, about all of this, but I really appreciate the fact that you cared enough about me to come up and talk to me about this. And this woman looked at me and said, I don't care about you. And I looked at her and I went, well, if your motivation for coming up and correcting me uh, was anything other than you loving me and caring about me, then I really don't have time to listen to you. And she stopped off. Well, next day I was back at my office and I got a uh, phone call from Pastor Chuck Smith and and he said, well, I understand you don't like organ music. <laughs> it turns out that this woman uh, was the daughter of the organist at Calvary Costa Mesa. They had come in and had a uh, meeting with Chuck about uh, what I had said. And uh, I thought, oh boy, here we go. Next thing is going to be pack up your bags. But he kind of laughed and he said, well, you know, there's certain things you can't preach about in church. Don't preach about Santa Claus and don't preach about choirs and above all, don't preach about organ music and I think you'll be just fine. I said, yes, sir. Thank you very much. But, you know, I never forgot that that message. You know, you never know who's listening and sometimes our words can do a lot of damage and we're just kind of talking off the cuff. So I felt corrected by that. I felt a lot more corrected by Chuck Smith showing me mercy than this woman coming up and giving it to me with both barrels. So, you know, as Galatians says, uh, you are spiritual resource, which are looking to yourself lest you be tempted. You know, if you're in a situation where you do have to drop some heavies on somebody, sometimes we really do, and, and, and that is an act of love. But always ask yourself the question, if the roles were reversed, how would I want someone to approach me in this set of circumstances? So I, I think if we can keep those things in balance, uh, I, I hope that's kind of the issue that was, was being raised there as far as speaking the truth and love is concerned. But it's an art form and we're all learning and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. That's why uh, we've really got to be gracious with one another as the Lord gives us grace because, you know, we, we all got blind spots and sometimes uh, we end up uh, stomping on people's sensibilities uh, we don't even realize we're doing it, and sometimes they do the same to us. So, you know, just uh, ask the Lord for that grace, that uh, that grease that keeps us together, grace, and uh, I think we'll be all right. All right. A question from Dave wants to know, how do you balance loving your spouse and giving yourself completely but not being emotionally dependent? Or is there an expected level of emotional dependency in a marital relationship? So in marriage, how do you walk that fine line between codependency and, of course, just not caring about your spouse at all? You know, I think, uh, Dave, maybe the, the best thing to do in those set of circumstances is, boy, keep the uh, directions right in front of you. Uh, you know, in uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, they might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, notice there's two sets of instructions regarding a husband and a wife's relationship in a marriage. A wife is to submit to a husband's spiritual leadership like the church does to Christ. Why? Because the husband's so much smarter, because he's so much better, more, more spiritual. No, because the wife has been given that call from God. This is the wife's role, to be the supporter of her husband, to have her husband's back spiritually, to encourage him in the role that he has of being the spiritual leader. No, I'm not constantly second-guessing, not criticizing, and so on. When we take things into our own hands uh, and uh, you know find ourselves uh, saying, oh, I can't trust dummy, and I better do this sort of thing, or on the other side of the coin, uh, becoming some kind of a doormat in a relationship. Notice it says that we're to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, if the husband says, I want you to do something immoral, I want you to do something illegal, uh, I want you to do something because I'm in the flesh, and that's that, uh, you know, the, the wife is under no obligation to enable a husband to go down a sinful path. She's to submit as unto the Lord. Why? 
because her role in the relationship is that if the world wants to find out how the church lovingly submits to Jesus' uh, leadership in the best possible sense, they should be able to watch that in micro in how the woman relates to the man. Similarly, the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Now, when Christ loved the church, he didn't love us in a codependent way. He didn't go to the cross by saying, oh, maybe if I go to the cross, then they'll finally uh, think I'm okay, and they'll, they'll finally think I'm all right, and oh, you know, I don't want to upset them, you know, or, or tell them that what they're, they're doing, the way they're walking in their lives is, is wrong or off base. I'm just going to be this uh, nice spiritual yes man that's going on here. That's not the way Jesus demonstrated to us uh, what a husband is to do. Again, a husband is to sacrificially love his wife so that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So, you know, I think the only way, you know, we as human beings get out of unhealthy relationships, Dave, is to make sure that our compass heading is a healthy relationship. And the only way that you have a healthy relationship kind of comes down to that old passage in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? If both parties in the relationship are not, first of all, 100%, 100% committed to having the Lord's will done in their life, you're asking for trouble. If both parties in the relationship having that commitment do not uh, come to a place where they both define what it means to please the Lord in the relationship is a 100%, 100% commitment to God's word as the final decider, the final arbiter of how the relationship is going to be conducted. Then you got problems. You're walking together, but you're not agreed. And when you're walking together and you're not agreed, suddenly not faith is the thing that binds you together and focusing in on Jesus. It's fear. And if it's fear, then manipulation starts to come in because we're just defending ourselves and trying to, you know, to, to keep our, our guard up at all times because we're worried about us and me and being fearful. If I'm loving my wife like Christ loved the church, I give up that fear because I realize I'm already a dead man. Uh, I, I'm not here to preserve my propers or my place or my privileges or my pleasures. I'm here because I want to see her become everything God wants her to be. Not everything I want her to be, but everything that God wants her to be. And, and so if I focus in on that, if I realize that, uh, boy, you know, uh, Jesus was the father of the bride when I got married. And as the father of the bride, I have a responsibility. Yeah, sometimes to defer what I would like in a set of circumstances for her benefit and for her, her betterment or for her good. Uh, I have the responsibility of sometimes, you know, drawing a line and saying, you know, hey, you know, this attitude that you've got going here, you know, is not honoring the Lord. Uh, that's why, you know, when I talk with couples about getting married, I always emphasize the point that getting married is a call to ministry. Uh, you know, you've heard about bad pastors and ones that live in fear of their congregation and they water down the word because they don't want to offend J.P. Gottrocks, who's given you know, X amount of money to the church and all this. And, and they go down that path and it, it always ends up in disaster. In the same way, if we look at marriage as a ministry, if I look at this as, wow, God has entrusted, in my case, my wife Pam, to be in my life in such a way that when it's all said and done at the end of the day, uh, when, say, my memorial service is going on, my wife can really look at the way that I related to her and say, you know what? That guy really helped me grow in Jesus. He really helped me grow in my relationship with him. I know the word better. I love the Lord more. I have a more fruitful life because this guy was in my life. Then I've done my job. You know, if just the end of it was, well, you know, I'm going to miss that guy because he really kind of facilitated anything I ever wanted to do and let me get away with murder. And I'm more of a spoiled individual than I was before I met him. And boy, I find, better find somebody else who can write the checks and keep me spoiled now that this guy's gone. Then I've missed it. You see, it, that's, that's on me because the husband is to be the spiritual leadership 
within the home. So, you know, when subjects like being codependent and, and so on uh, come up, you know, first of all, when people are beha behaving in codependent ways, first and foremost, they're not being honest. They're, they're lying to one another. They're not presenting who they really are. And back in the bushes of Eden, uh, sizing up fig leaves is, is what's going on. You know, and so there needs to be repentance for all of that. Just say, you know what, uh, you know, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. My need for love and acceptance, that unconditional love and acceptance that I was created for, I can't look to my wife to meet that need primarily. You know, it's asking her to do something that she can't do because she's just as fallen as I am. If on the other side of the coin, I come into the relationship and I say to myself, you know what? I can't love my wife the way she needs to be loved, but Jesus, you can. And, and so the first thing that I need to do is I need to have you, Lord, be the one that makes me okay inside. You are the one that has to, uh, you know, fulfill my need for unconditional love and acceptance because it just doesn't exist apart from that. So if I come to the Lord and I daily am asking him to be the one that fills my cup and I share out of the overflow of that with my spouse, then suddenly all the codependent games, the manipulations and things like that uh, are going to fall by the wayside. I don't need to do that because my need for unconditional love and acceptance is met. You know, it says that the beastie that often chases us round and round in this world is the fear of abandonment. That if, uh, you know, I don't toe the line that people are going to find out that I'm really, you know, not all that and I'm going to be cast aside and that's that. And it's a terrifying idea. But the only way to solve that is to make sure that you've got first and foremost as your job one, receiving God's love and relating God's love. You know, I, I sometimes will say uh, to my wife, Pam, you know, I'm not in this relationship because I need you. Uh, and that sounds like completely contrary to everything we've ever heard in pop music, right? But I do say to her, I'm in this relationship because God has given me a great love for you. Now, which of these two do you suppose is going to be a better basis for security and stability and spiritual growth? If I say to my wife, I need you, I need you, don't ever go away from me because I don't know what I'd ever do, you know, and then suddenly all the pressure's on her because I, she's got this dependent human being, you know, just clamoring after her to give something that she can't give. Uh, on the other side of the coin, if I say to her, you know what, God's met my need, I'm at peace, I know that the Lord is, is my provision, I know that he, he will never leave me and never forsake me, and he has called me to love you like he loves me. Boy, that is an incredible basis for security and stability in the church. And the, the reason I've kind of gone off on sermonette here is, uh, you know, if, if I could communicate anything to uh, couples in relationships who are struggling, that's what I'd communicate. If I could communicate to anyone who is looking at getting married or even considering sometime in the future getting married, the single most important love lesson I've ever learned is this. I got to go to Jesus first. I got to receive his love first and share out of that overflow. And if I find myself, you know, I, I'm married to such a fantastic uh, person that uh, she loves me so wonderfully that it's very easy sometimes for me to start leaning on her rather than the Lord. And I usually find out I'm doing that by a sense of unease within my life. I, I you know, I, I find myself getting touchy or, or, you know, critical or things like this. And it's like God's tapping me on the shoulder going, you're, you're looking to Pam to give you something I alone can give. No wonder you're frustrated. Why don't you come back to me? Let me fill your cup and start sharing out of that overflow. And, you know, as often as I do, there's great peace there. So, you know, even sometimes when everything's going great in a relationship, it can be dangerous in that it can get you to put your eggs in the wrong basket. Jesus is the only one whose love will ever satisfy us. He's designed us that way, as uh, our good friend Beau Willett with his uh, 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 devotions uh, with Blaise Pascal on Saturday mornings would point out. Pascal was the one who observed that inside each of us is a God-shaped vacuum that only he can fill. And uh, if uh, we try to fill it, with anything or anyone else, 
then of course the rest of the relationship is going to be off kilter. And, and so normally when things are messed up on the horizontal, it's a reflection of the fact that things are messed up on the vertical. And until you get the vertical in place, the horizontal is never going to come into place. So uh, that's the most important thing. And, and if you can just remember this, it will save you hours and hours of marriage counseling and it will cause your marriage to just thrive and grow and flourish and be everything God wants it to be. Okay. Question from Michael wants to know, is it Amen. normal for a <laughs> Christian to struggle with their faith? The answer to that, Michael, is yes. You wouldn't struggle or fight to keep something if you didn't care about it. But understand as well that there's a difference, as the recently glorified Ravi Zacharias once observed, between a question and a doubt. Yes. He has had plenty of questions leveled his way and from his own mind about his faith, but never a doubt, because the difference is this. A question is looking for an answer. A doubt is the belief there is no answer. So if your struggle is that you keep asking yourself questions, understand that means because you want to make sure you have the answer. But if on the other hand you keep finding yourself in this rut of the doubts and it's like, oh, is this thing even true? And uh, how could Christianity claim this and that? And you find yourself foreshadowing uh, perhaps yet another uh, Christian uh, deconversion testimony on Instagram, usually in line with a new relationship or record deal. I'm being facetious, of course. <laughs> but when we're talking about this issue of how do I know that I know that I know I believe that this is true and that it actually is the case, I'm not just kidding myself. Well, the bridge between the two is pretty easy to sort out as you figure out what needs to be known and what can be sorted out for later clarification. And as far as a passage that says this is how you can know for certain that what we're doing here isn't just wasting our time, uh, go to First John chapter 5 and verse 9. Uh, John the Apostle, who knew a thing or two about what Jesus said and did and the evidence he had, the reasons he had to believe that this was authentic, as he said this, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Couldn't be more emphatic about this. And the, and he goes on to say that these things I have written to you, you who believe in the Son of the God, in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the Son of God. Uh, the chapter concludes in verse 20, where he says, "And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus." And this is the true God and eternal life. So when we're asked the question about Christianity, is it going to be based on whether or not Solomon had uh, 400,000 chariots or 4,000, given the archaeological recovery of his stables and the textual variance between Second Chronicles and First Kings? I don't think people could remember that phrase, let yep. alone deduce it. <laughs> yeah. uh, is it going to depend on whether or not these words from men say, well, the Bible has errors in it, and you don't, and if there is a single error, as I define it, of course, then that means that the Bible as a whole can't be trusted. Uh, if uh, people start waxing and eloquent about the Greek and say, well, because we can't know for certain what this means based on my presentation of it, then that means that we can't understand anything about it. You may as well just do what you want and then let the debt that uh I guess the monopoly illustration is let the uh, money and the board go back in the box when all is said and done. It's not going to matter. Well, here's the problem. If there's ever something that we need to know as Christians beyond any reasonable doubt, it has to be centered on the person who put Christ in Christianity. If it stands or falls in the person of Jesus Christ, we know we're standing on solid ground. Right. And then from there, we can start sorting out extra details like biblical archaeology and uh, textual criticism and all these other other fun things. But when it ultimately comes down to it, what are the fundamentals? What does everyone here need to know and the reasons they can believe that they know that Jesus not only was, but was who he said he was? Yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, what it really comes down to was the proof that Jesus put forth, and that was his, uh, the 
only sign that he would give the scribes and the Pharisees that he would die and be risen from the dead. Uh, if Jesus has died and has risen from the dead, then everything else he has to say and everything else the Bible has to say about him is, uh, can be uh, accepted and trusted. If that particular fact is uh, still up for debate uh, or isn't settled in the mind of an individual, then uh, all kinds of beasties and doubts can come in. So if someone were to ask you, Sean, why do you think Jesus rose from the dead? What would you say? Well, because friends and foes saw him alive again after his death. If he died, that means he had to have been born at some point. And if enemies believe the same thing that the allies saw, that probably means something was there. We can give citation to all these claims, and uh, I think we got a little time. First of all, uh, when people wave these out of hand, they're throwing out all of history if they're going to be consistent with these standards. So just be prepared for that. The evidence hasn't changed because it's still just as good as when we first found it. Right. That's the point. Right. Uh, first of all, the Roman historian Tacitus, who lived about the beginning of the second century, uh, was not a fan of Christians by any means, and in fact lived and pioneered such a time where they were referred to as haters and enemies of the state. Atheists, because yeah. they didn't worship Caesar. Yeah, yeah, they didn't worship all the gods. They just believed in this one narrow god. This very interesting individual acknowledged not only Jesus' existence, but his crucifixion. Josephus, the same way, not only acknowledged that Jesus was executed as a sorcerer, but made interesting claims to be the Messiah himself himself, but also on top of that backs up the execution of the Apostle James that will be important in a moment. We are also told, interestingly enough, by individuals like Marb on Seraphon, Pliny the Elder, and others who by no means were Christians admitting to the death of Jesus. This is as sure as anything historical ever can be, the death of Jesus. And by the way, that's a quote from the atheist and head of the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Cross and James D.C. Dunn, and others. Uh, you can look this all up on your own time. But when it ultimately comes down to the reason why we believe that he not only died, that would just make him like any one of us, it comes back to, was he alive again after his death? Well, how do we know that in history? Same way we know anything else in history. Do we have witnesses, and can we trust them? And starting, of course, with the primary eyewitnesses and Christian sources, we've got Peter, we've got Paul, or we'll get to him in a moment, but we've got the P Peter, we've got James, we've got uh, Paul the Apostle, we've got the Twelve, we have over 500 documented eyewitnesses at one time. But the two most important individuals that would verify Jesus' execution and resurrection as beyond any reasonable doubt historically were the Apostle Paul, formerly the Saul, uh, the Pharisee, Saul, and James, the brother of Jesus, or the son of Joseph. Okay, why those two? Because neither of them believed in Jesus' message until after his execution. Now, it's one thing for his followers and supporters to believe in Jesus after his execution. Maybe they just wanted to revive the movement. But if you have people who not only were living quite a substantial and lucrative lifestyle before Jesus and embraced one of persecution, exile, and torture, all of the Apostle Paul, or someone who thought that his brother was insane until his death, then afterwards did a complete 180 and was willing to be killed for his beliefs, something happened and yeah yeah well awesome well that is the foundation stone if you got that under your belt then the rest as they say are details hey thanks so much for being with us on the broadcast god bless you have a great rest of your day in the Lord. you've been listening to a reason for hope thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through god's word one question of the heart at a time until we meet again we would love to connect with you you can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com you can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.